Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 36 of the Stroke Cast. This week, I got to chat with stroke survivor Dan Oosterhaus, former pilot and current tennis coach at the U.S. Air Force Academy about his experience recovering from two strokes. The first thing to know about Dan's story is that it's reminiscent of a number of others I've heard and will be bringing to you in the coming weeks. A young, athletic person has a stroke when no one ever expected it. Uh, This can happen to anyone at any age, and that's becoming a bigger and bigger deal. More and more young folks are having strokes, and it's one of the reasons why I started this show, to be able to talk about that and help people recognize it and deal with it when it happens. Uh, We heard about young strokes from uh, Ted and and Tom over the last few weeks, and we'll hear similar things from Whitney and Maggie in coming weeks. And that's why it is so important to know the be fast signs, balance, eyes, face, arms, speech, and time to call 911 when you see that. And never make the mistake of thinking stroke is something that can only happen to folks who are over 70. So make sure that not only you know the BFAST signs, but that other people in your household and in your workplace and in your social circle also know BFAST and know what to look for and know when to call 911 or 999 in some other places in the world, or whatever number it is you call to get an ambulance to you as quickly as possible. Dan's story overall is one of seeing a problem and trying to fix it. During his rehab, he worked closely with his therapists, and he was always pushing for more therapy and more information. He asked questions, he asked for additional resources to learn more about anatomy and physiology, and generally focused on what was going on with his body and how he could get better. Aside from it being an important element of recovery, I I found in my experience that the more engaged I was in my recovery, uh, the more my therapists were engaged too because they love working with folks who want to get better, who want to learn more, who want to ask questions and know more. So engage with your therapists on your recovery. Ask the questions. Figure out what you need to do to learn what's going on in your body. It also becomes a lot easier to provide feedback to them when instead of describing you know, an issue with your leg, you can talk about an issue with your adductor or with flexion or extension and to just sort of understand some of this vocabulary. So take the opportunity to learn from these therapists because they love talking about this stuff. It's one of the reasons why they went into this field. What I also hear when I listen back to this week's episode is how much Dan's problem-solving drive helped him to get where he is today. A lot of it was about finding a problem and then trying to figure out a solution. And that was part of his background before the stroke, and it's been critical to his success since the stroke. Dan talked about something else that reminded me a little bit of my own experience. In talking about his stroke, he talks about feeling the fluid suddenly coursing through his body. And when he was talking about that, it made me think of one of the weirder sensations I experienced in the hospital during those early days, and that was rolling into the CT machine. Uh, I had my first CT scan, and then they told me they are going to take a moment, and they were going to inject the contrast fluid into my IV. And that was the first time I had ever felt something like that, where unlike just you know, a a vaccination or another injection where you feel the needle. In this case, you know, feeling that warm or hot liquid start flowing into my veins and then start circulating throughout my body. That was a really weird experience. And that was just something that came to me as Dan was uh, talking about his own experience in feeling fluid flow through the body. There are all sorts of new sensations you feel and encounter when going through the medical system that you might never have expected before. But let's talk a little bit more about Dan's background. After a day spent coaching the men's tennis team at the United States Air Force Academy in 2013, Dan Oosterhaus suffered two brainstem strokes that resulted in a substantial loss of function in his left arm and leg. Since then, 
Dan has made significant strides in his recovery, owing much to the support of his three children, Emma, Anna, and Andrew, and the rehabilitative power of competition. Dan has fueled his recovery through opportunities in adaptive sports as a member of the 2014 Air Force Wounded Warrior Team and a member of the 2014 and 2016 USA Invictus Games team. Dan has earned medals in swimming at the 2014 Warrior Games and in cycling at the 2016 Invictus Games. In 2014, he received the U.S. Air Force Academy's General Mal Wacken Character and Leadership Award for his inspirational work with cadets and resiliency during his recovery. Dan, a native of Texarkana, Texas, graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1993 and remains one of the best tennis players in the team's history. Dan ranks fifth on the all-time list for the most wins at number one singles and second on the career list at number one doubles. He was selected to the all-conference team all four years and received the team's most valuable player award three times. During his 21-year Air Force career, Dan accumulated over 3,100 hours as an instructor pilot in three aircraft, the C-5, C-21, and T-53. After retiring early from the Air Force Academy as a pilot due to his stroke, he continues to serve as the men's tennis coach, doing it all with one good arm and one good leg. He loves sharing his message about the importance of a positive attitude in recovery. Now, let's meet Dan. Well, Dan, welcome to StrokeCast. I'm thrilled you could join us this week. Thanks so much, Bill. So, we've heard a little bit about your background. But what was your life like before the stroke and leading up to it? Well, looking back, um, I, I had a great life. Um, you know, I was um, an active duty Air Force officer. I'm um, a dad with three teenagers, um, all very healthy and active, great kids. Um, I had the job of my dreams. Um, I was working at the Air Force Academy. Um, I was the head tennis coach there and also an instructor pilot. So um, everything was, was going really well. Wow, that, that, that certainly sounds like that was plenty to keep you busy. And, uh, yeah, very, very busy. And, uh, and really a dream for a lot of folks. Um, yeah, I mean, it was something that I, you know, I worked hard you know, to, to kind of pursue some goals that I set when I was younger. And um, you know, one of them was to, to be the coach at the Air Force Academy in the, you know, the tennis program, which is where I played tennis in college. And so I was, you know, kind of living out my dream job. And, and of course, one of the things that, you know, all of us survivors have found is that all of this can sort of change at a moment's notice. And, and, and so what happened that day that you had your yeah, stroke? It, it, was, um, it was a day just like any other. Uh, I worked at school that morning because I actually gave a lesson to one of the cadets on my team. We, we actually went out and played that morning and um, we had a match that night. Um, so I was you know, kind of getting him ready and, and doing some last minute coaching. And, and I went, I went out and like I said, played, I really felt like, you know, I was 42 at the time, but I felt physically as healthy as I've ever been in my entire life. You know, it was 20 years prior that I was a cadet and, you know, playing college tennis. And, and I, I felt as fit as I ever did when I was in my twenties. So, you know, I did that in the morning and then probably taught some classes in the afternoon And and your career certainly encourages a a very high level of physical fitness at that point. It certainly did. I mean, being in the military, um, you know, you you have to be fit because all the stuff that we do is, um, you know, it's, you're, you're very active. I I did travel all over the world and and went to some really amazing places and being a pilot, it's a, it's a pretty physically demanding, you know, job. So I, I, I felt like I was in great shape, you know? And so that, that evening we had a match, you know, a tennis match in college last couple hours and we, we played a great match. I came home and you know, was with my kids that night. My bedtime routine was to kind of watch some video of the match and you know get, get ready for the next one, kind of kind of break down some film. And I think I fell asleep um, that night in my bed watching my video <laughs> of the team. And I I remember waking up, and it varies it's very distinctly because I, I still remember exactly how it happened. Um, I was sleeping on my stomach, and I woke up and lifted my neck and felt a just like a, a pulse um just like a big surge go down the right side of my body um with a cramp in the 
in the trap, you know, you have the muscle that connects kind of the back of your neck up to the top of your, the bottom of your skull, um, that started cramping. And then I just felt the right side of my body, get really, really tingly. And it just, um, you know, almost felt like someone was just pouring warm water over that side of my body. And it just kind of felt like a fluid sensation. And I didn't really think anything of it, but I got up to go to the bathroom and fell down on the ground. Um, and you know, thought, okay, my legs asleep or something, something strange is going on and ended up uh, getting up again, falling down. Um, probably did that three or four times and just the rest of the way crawled to the bathroom and ended up um, vomiting because I had severe nausea at the time. Um, and so I just thought, you know, this is, this is strange. I've got a headache. I've got a cramp on my neck, I'm not walking and I'm throwing up. So I must have some kind of flu symptoms and never once thought that I was having a stroke and tried to go back to bed, you know, which was a pretty big mistake. Yeah. Um, yes. A stroke is not something that's easy enough to sleep off. No. So I, I was, you know, my kids were at the house, um, but they were upstairs. They didn't know what was going on. I, I, I tried to go back to bed. I really did. I found myself sleep or falling asleep in my closet. I, I laid down on the ground. Like I, I was all over my floor. Um, did this for about six hours. And then finally got on the internet on my, you know, tablet and just typed in some of the symptoms I was having. And the first thing that came up was stroke. And it took me six hours to realize that that's what was going on. So I was, I was completely out of it. Um, you know, and uh, got myself to the hospital, um, and uh, that's you know where it, it finally hit me because they, they did all the scans on me and realized that yeah you know they did the test with my arms and my my speech and everything and then they, they did a couple imagery um, tests and did, and found that I had had a stroke, but they they weren't sure they could treat me there so they they put me on an ambulance for about an hour and a half car ride up to Denver um, or ambulance ride up to Denver and. We, I, I stayed there for four days and um, I really thought that, you know, I was going to have surgery or, you know, get this clot removed. Um, there was not a very conclusive diagnosis. Um, mm -hmm. They did say that it was most likely my vertebral artery, the right one that dissected and mm -hmm. caused a clot. But I, I fully expected to have, you know, some sort of treatment done. Um, but their, their best diagnosis was, Hey, we just, we want you to take it easy. Um, and we don't think this will happen again. Um, you're very lucky that you survived the brainstem stroke. That's where the, the clock hit was in the brainstem. So I, I left after four days and began my outpatient feeling like, yeah, I'd really dodged a bullet. And this was, you know, this was the start of a new life and I was going to be okay. Um, got back to my job and uh, was taking it really easy, was not playing tennis yet. You know, I was, I was working about half time and the other times was going to rehab. All that was going really well, and I was I was really motivated to improve. And and then um, three weeks later to the day, uh, same exact situation. Woke up on my stomach, lifted my head, and I felt the exact same um, you know pulse sensation go down the left side of my body this time, cramp in that side of my neck, and knew instantly what had happened. And I called 911 and told them I was having a stroke and they came within a minute or two because they were right across the street and I was just sitting there waiting for them. And they, they were a little bit of disbelief when they saw me because they said, where's the stroke patient? And I said, well, it's me. I'm having a stroke right now. And they didn't really understand how I could know that, but because I was talking and everything looked fine, but I just said, I've been through this before, so I know what's happening. Um, I said, but this one's not as bad, you know, because it, I was still walking. Uh -huh. um, and it turned out that it was uh, a very severe stroke on the left side and essentially, um, you know, took out all the motor and sensory uh, function on the left side of my body, um, you know, from the shoulder down. So I was in the hospital for a month um, and went through some very intensive inpatient rehab and, um, and then, you know, got back home. Had a tremendous, you know, recovery with my family there helping me, and uh, you know, five years later, um, I'm back doing the job that I absolutely love. That's a, a pretty, pretty good example of um, 
or just description of the last five years, I guess. Right, right. And what I think is really interesting there is the vertebral artery dissection. That seems to be what we hear about most in folks who are already very physically fit and have a stroke. And uh, my understanding is that basically what happens is there's an injury inside the artery from either an unknown cause or a physical trauma that makes that that artery sort of have a rougher texture, which leads to formation of clots, which can then float up and get stuck elsewhere in the brain. Is is, is that a fairly accurate yeah. description of that? Um, you know, I, I think like you, after our strokes, you know, we, we want to know everything we can about why it happened and, and what we can do to prevent the next one, how to get better. So I, I learned as much as I could about, um, you know, just the structures in the brain. And that's exactly what I heard about. Um, in my case, through uh, all the scans that I've done, they discovered that my right vertebral artery is extremely thin. And uh, compared to the size and diameter of my left one, it was probably uh, a third or a quarter of the dimensions. And so oh, that wow. was probably the way I was born. And it was just just hanging on, you know, it was just, it was, um, it worked as hard as it could for, for 42 years. And finally, I think it, I think it, you know, it, it tore a little bit. And like you said, it, you know, caused a little bit of a clot and, um, and then, you know, that's what, that's what went to the brainstem. So, um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm very lucky cause it could have been, it could have been a complete rupture. Um, it could have been, uh, you know, something that if the clot happens anywhere else in the brainstem besides where it happened to me, I could have lost all kinds of different things. So it, um, it could have happened while you were flying a jet. Well, absolutely. You know, it could have happened at any time. I mean, I spent a lot of hours in the air and that would have been, that would have been devastating, obviously. So, um, yeah, very lucky it happened while I was sleeping. The strokes, you know, they, they're not short events. Um, I remember my second one lasted about 20 hours from the time I had my first symptom until the time I noticed that the deficits were complete. And it was, you know, it wasn't like a car crash or it wasn't like an a, you know, instantaneous trauma. It was a long, long, uh, drawn out, um, you know, very, very worrisome event because you just never know how much further it's going to go. Um, it was all contained on my left side, but I, I started to feel my breathing getting really short and the muscles in my chest were getting weak. And I was really nervous that it was just going to, you know, take me out. And I just, I was really afraid to, uh, you know, to see how far it was going to progress. But finally it, it, it did stop. I love rehab. Um, that sounds crazy, but I, from the moment, you know, after that, the last, you know, the 20th hour that I said was, you know, the, where I, I knew that the stroke was over from that moment, I really focused on, you know, my recovery and trying to get back as much as I could. I, I do remember my neurologist talking to me right after, you know, it happened that next morning and said, look, you know, this is, this is very severe where it occurred. And my best guess is that you're going to get 50% back on your left side. And that, that was devastating to hear as a, you know, as a, um, a very active person, you know, to hear that, um, because my last stroke, I, I was, you know, recovering pretty well on the right side. And I thought, well, this, this shouldn't be much worse. Right. And he right. said, well, it's that long term. So that, at that moment, I thought, you know what, if, um, if I, if I can just make that, you know, my goal is to get a hundred percent out of that 50%, then I'm going to work as hard as I can. And so I had great therapists. I had incredible OT and PT support and patient. Um, and I, I think they were motivated because um, I was motivated. And it was, it just, we just worked off each other. And I was up ready to go in the morning every, every chance I could. I wanted to do extra sessions um, because I, I did see folks that were there that weren't as fortunate. And, you know, I was in good health when it happened. So I feel like I was at a good starting point compared to other folks. And I just, I really wanted to work hard when I was in the hospital and I, I tried to make the most of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that's been my experience in talking with PTs and OTs as well, is that a lot of the patients just don't have the focus and don't have the energy on recovery. And in some cases it's because they're already dealing with so many other issues later in life and, and sort of winding down. But when you've got a patient who, regardless of their age, is like, nope, I want to live. I want to go out. I want to do stuff. I want to get stuff done. I want to do the work 
to to get there, the PTs and OTs really just seem to come alive at at realizing oh, they have somebody they can actually work with. I love that part of it. Yeah. So it was I was always learning. You know, I was trying. I, I asked them for some of their their books on you know things that were you know different types of muscles I could try to engage, and it was just it was a whole educational process for me, and so I I just ate it up. Awesome. So why do you think you were so successful in the recovery? Is it just the basics of doing the work? Well, um, I, I think, um, you know, everybody's different and every, every, every challenge that everybody faces is, is different. Um, but, but one thing that's always been really, you know, constant in my life is that I've, I've always tried to have a positive attitude. And so, you know, I, I looked at this as just another challenge um, that I faced and I did not, I, I never looked at it like, oh my gosh, why did this happen to me? You know, how, how, how can, you know, somebody so healthy like myself just, you know, now be um, essentially paralyzed on half their body you know, just overnight. And so I did not, I did not worry about that. I just, I just tried to remain positive and look at it as this is something I can overcome. This is a, an obstacle um, that I'm just going to work really hard at. And that's, it's really how I faced everything that I've done, you know, up to that point in my life, whether it was in you know, school or college or, you know, playing sports or, you know, learning how to fly an airplane, everything I did was just, you know, a challenge um, to me that I wanted to, uh, to tackle. And so this was, this was just another one of those, um, you know, just like a, a mountain or a hill to climb. I just wanted to go up it, you know, um, so that was one thing was just the, the power of the positive attitude that I knew I had to have. Um, the second probably was, uh, you know, the fact that um, I mentioned this before, but I was, I was healthy to begin with. So I think that was a good position to be in. Um, I knew what physical exercise did for the body. I knew, you know, how to do that. I knew how to work hard. Um, so I was not afraid of that hard work um, because that was just part of who I was. Um, so that I think that's that's something that's very um, important. And you know the the third and it's you know it's a long term recovery. Um, I met somebody pretty early on in my recovery that just really um, I, I think was the the soul and the key for me to to be doing the things I'm doing. Um, my fiance Megan, she. Um, she and I met through just a kind of a shared um, blog that we did on, on our recovery. So her situation was different, but um, you know, she supported me all along the way and was just tremendously inspirational for my recovery and having somebody there with me um, to, you know, to share and talk about, you know, um, you know, setbacks or accomplishments or goals just really, really helped. So just having that, that, you know, incredible support um was was another key to the you know my recovery now that is fantastic and you know that's there's there's a few key things that are so important in that first of all i think a lot of times we think uh many folks approach health and fitness as well you know i'm where i'm at today and and that's that's fine i can take care of this in another year or another two years or another five years and you know if you put that off, you can be in a much worse situation when something suddenly happens, like a clot comes off of an unexpectedly small vertebral artery. None of us uh, really appreciate, I think, um, every day that, that we're, like we should. And, you know, whether you're able-bodied or you have um, you know, some sort of disability, I, I really think that the, the key is to appreciate, you know, what you can do today. And, you know, because you may not be able to do it tomorrow. I've certainly seen that in my life, and um, and now I'm, I'm I really try to to enjoy every moment that I have. That is awesome. That is awesome, and that definitely makes a big makes it a lot easier to go ahead and pursue those tough goals yeah. when you can really enjoy that and enjoy the process along the way. And, and of course, one of the things that that probably you know that that definitely helped you be in the uh, the fit state level of fitness you were in addition to obviously the the demands of of military life is your career with tennis and that's that's really been something that's gone throughout your life what is it about tennis that you're so passionate about you know i, I got hooked on it when i was a little kid my dad um he joined like a tennis and swim club when we were a little bitty 
and that's the the main sport that I played. I, I think we would go there in the mornings and you know swim and play tennis just about every day in the summer. And it was it was a sport that I just I picked up pretty uh, pretty quick. And um, you know I, I loved all sports, but for some reason tennis was a sport that I could do on my own. Um, I could compete at it, you know, and really um, you know see the see the progress I was making, you know, because tennis is a it's an individual sport and it's very physical, but also as I've become a coach and, and, you know, have been around the game for more years, I realized that it's, uh, it's one of the most challenging sports mentally. I believe it's out there when you get to a certain level that um, the mental side of the game just becomes more and more important. And that's the challenge that I love. I love so much about it. So I think it's just, it's always been something that I've wanted to, you know, just to get deeper and deeper in and help people out, um, you know, becoming the best tennis players they can be, but also, knowing that the skills you learn from this sport um, can help you, you know, wait all, all through your life. And it certainly has done that for me. Awesome. So what do you, what do you say to other parents or other kids who are thinking about tennis or how do you encourage them to go ahead and, and pursue it as, as an opportunity? Yeah, it's, it's a great sport that you can play, you know, all over the country, you can play it, um, all through your life. You know, I'm a great example of somebody who right now, like I, I don't use my left arm um, when I'm playing because, you know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work like it used to. So <laughs> you can play tennis with a disability, you can play able body, you can play tennis in a wheelchair. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a sport that you can play at all different levels. Um, and it's, it's incredible for your fitness and it's a lot of fun, you know, so there in every town, there's opportunities you can get involved in, um, whether it's a club or just a clinic. Um, and the way I learned was to hit on a, on a wall, you know, so it doesn't take much to get started. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those things that sort of ties into a lot of things. I grew up in New York city and, uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of tennis in my neighborhood, but what we did have was a lot of games on similar principles, everything from box ball, where you're yeah. starting with the, the rubber ball, the rubber spalding and batting it back and forth between two people across two squares on the sidewalk. Or yeah. we'd have these parks with just these 20 and 30 foot tall concrete walls that you would just uh, play with a paddle or a racket or just by hand and just batting against the wall. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a... There's a lot that you can do. I mean, racket sports, all racket sports. I, I like love racquetball, squash, anything. Um, I'll even go out and play badminton. I, I love anything. <laughs> like so how has uh, tennis really contributed to your recovery? I imagine as a coach, you already had a deeper understanding of anatomy and physiology and muscle structure than, than, than many folks do. Um, did that play a part in it? it? It absolutely did. You know, one of the, one of the first goals that I, I made for myself um, when I was recovering was that I wanted to play tennis again. You know, it was, um, it was just a, a very simple goal that I set out, you know, from the very beginning. And I knew that to do that, um, there was a lot that I had to, to improve in. And, um, and so the way I looked at it was, okay, you know, I don't know when it's going to happen, when I'm going to be able to do it again, but that's, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to play tennis again. And, and so I just set out every day of, of making smaller goals to, to accomplish, um, you know, whether it be put my clothes on or, you know, stand up for five minutes or, or walk down this hallway. Um, I knew that, you know, the larger goal was out there, but each day I had to take just really small steps to get there. Um, and, and, you know, being able to play tennis again, obviously I wanted to keep my job. Um, that was the job that I was the most passionate about of, of anything really was, was to be the tennis coach at the Air Force Academy. Um, and so I worked really, really hard to, to essentially, um, you know, convince the athletic department and the school and everybody there that I was you know, recruiting to come play for me and my current players, but Hey, I, I am still, um, able to do this job. And, and probably I would say now five years later, um, way better than I was as a, as a younger coach, um, quite pre-stroke, which to me is, I'm um, looking back on it, something I'm very proud of. That is awesome. Yeah. It really forces you to go ahead and rethink your assumptions about how you move and how you do yeah. things, especially since when you grow up with something, you just sort of internalize that without necessarily yeah. understanding the steps to get there. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So in, in talking about um, then keeping your job, obviously a, a major concern for most folks after stroke, your situation is, of course, uh, very different from many folks. Uh, and for those of us who have not served in the military, understanding some of that process, understanding some of that process can be a little, uh, little more complicated. So how does the military work with folks who are going through a long-term recovery from a disability like a stroke or, or, or something related to that? I mean, I think we, we generally think of um, what the military does for, uh, related to combat injuries, but for something other than that, how does the, how does the Air Force work with that? Well, I, I knew nothing about that, obviously, before, and uh, I can tell you that there's no better um, you know, company, there's no better institution that cares for its employees than the military. And I, I you know, have seen it day in and day out, what, what it's done for me. Um, from the, you know, the minute that I had my stroke, I was active duty, so I, you know, I had a, um, a good health care plan. It's called TRICARE, that's what the, the military uses, which means that we can have, um, you know, we have doctors on our base and doctors at the, where we work, but if, it, if, it, if you exceed that level of care, you know, they'll send you downtown to a civilian provider, which in my case is what, what happened. And so, you know, the, the benefits I got was, um, is I was, you know, full-time inpatient at an at excellent um, hospital downtown in Car Springs. And my insurance, the, the military health care insurance, paid for, paid for all of it. And it was, you know, something that, that um, when you join the military, you don't really think about health care, but because you're young and you're 18 and, you, you know, you're invincible. But and nothing is ever going to happen to you. Right, right. So, so I, was, um, I was so lucky, you know, to have that support um, because I, every, pretty much everything I, I needed um, was there for me. You know, if I wanted a different device, if I wanted to try out a new technique or, you know, a a new therapy, something that was, you know, may not have been approved. If I had a different insurance, I I got incredible support. And so um, that was kind of the upfront part of it, just getting through the initial trauma. But then, you know, the the life changing support that I've received is through the military has a program called Warrior Care and every branch of the service has it. And they've really developed it and made it, um, you know, very comprehensive in the last probably 10 years where they're not just getting, you know, wounded and injured and sick um, soldiers back, you know, to work, but they're actually getting them, you know, they're, they're doing much more for them. They are, they're letting them compete in adaptive sports. And we've, what we've found is that competing and, and doing those types of things that allow you to push your body physically and mentally uh, just really accelerate the rehabilitation process. And so I got linked up into adaptive sports right away, called it the Wounded Warrior Program in the Air Force. And uh, I mean, it was probably within a week out of, out, out of the hospital. You know, I, someone just noticed me in a, in, a, in a restaurant. I was walking with a walker and I had an Air Force shirt on and, and someone said, hey, you know, tell me what's going on. And I told him my story and he actually happened to be affiliated with the program and he got me started. And so the adaptive sports community have just completely changed, you know, the, the, the trajectory of my recovery. And I, I owe it a lot of it to that. And it's, you know, taken me all over the world to compete. I've, I've uh, got to compete in the Invictus Games, which Prince Harry started as a result of being at the Air Force Academy, watching one of the adaptive events where I was. And I uh, got to meet him a couple years later competing, you know, in England. Wow. So it's, and now it's gone full circle where I am now a coach for the wheelchair tennis um, part of the Invictus Games and hopefully going to be going to Australia at the end of this year to, to help out um, you know, servicemen and women who have had injuries and, you know, very uh, you know, significant deficits that um, it's just, it's just really, really, the, the military has taken so much, so good care of me. I can't, uh, can't explain it enough. Oh, that is fantastic. So you've since retired from active duty, but you're still the coach at the Air Force Academy then. Is that right? Yeah. So I was, um, you know, I was a, a pilot was my, my normal job because obviously, sure. you know, we don't, we're not training tennis professionals. So why was I a tennis coach at the Air Force Academy? Well, um, my main job was I was a pilot. Um, I flew 
airplanes for 15 years, was an instructor pilot, and I was able to pair that job with coaching. And so I came back as the head coach, but also I was flying while I was there. Once I had my strokes, um, I was unable to perform my flying duties. So because of the medication and because of the, the left-sided you know, um, hemichoresis, there's no way I could have gotten in an airplane safely with the standards that, they, that there are. So sure. they, they did a medical retirement for me. So they, they basically said, you know, sorry, it's been a great 21 years, but we have to let you go. And so, yeah, I, I did separate or retire from the military. So, so what is your life like today, your personal life and your work life? You know, it is, it is, uh, I would say even fuller and, um, you know, more, more fulfilling and enjoyable than it was pre stroke. Um, I, I've gotten back to a point now where, um, I think I probably am more productive. Um, I, like I said, I enjoy things more. I, I try to do, um, everything that I possibly can, um, to enjoy my children um, to enjoy my job. Um, you know, I, I'm engaged to an incredible woman that has just inspired me and we're, you know, we work together both in our, our shared recoveries. Um, so I believe that, uh, it's, um, it's just, when I look back on it in the last five years, I, I'm just, I'm very, very thankful that uh, I am where I am. That is fantastic. And being able to connect with other folks who have their own recoveries and their own disabilities to work through too yeah. becomes just so valuable. And it's one, one reason why I always encourage folks to, you know, find a local support group or find an online support group of other people who just, who just get it. You know, then that's, that's definitely something that, that I learned pretty early on. And I, I did go to um, neuro support groups from my hospital um, right away. Cause I was still impatient and they took me to the, you know, to a support group. And, um, I learned right away that when you get to talk about what's going on with you and the troubles you're having and the difficulties, um, and then hearing other folks, it's, uh, it's very encouraging, you know, and, and so you can, you can help, you know, help each other figure things out. And that's, that's one thing that I've noticed also with the, in the military, with the wounded warrior program is that, you know, they're, they're the most incredible people I've ever been around. And, you know, they, they don't, they don't make excuses. They don't uh, feel sorry for themselves. And it's just, it's really motivating to be around people that just work hard, no matter what condition they're in. And they're just, they're just trying to get better. You know, and that's, that's something that I've always, you know, been really, I've really tried to surround myself around those people. I know if they can do it, I can do it too. That is fantastic. So what, other lessons have you learned from your stroke and recovery that may help others or, or what do you wish other stroke survivors knew early on in the process? Um, well, what you hear a lot at the beginning is, Hey, you know, you, you're going to have all your recovery or most of your recovery in the first six months. You know, I heard that a lot. And so I worked really hard and you know, I wasn't going to, going to let that first six months go by without gaining as much back as I could. But five years later, I still don't have function in my left arm. You know, my fingers don't don't move unless, you know, I think you've said this on your podcast, when you yawn, open up. I mean, that's the function I have in my fingers. They're extremely toned. So five years later, you know, I I still have significant deficits. My left leg, you know, I, I don't move it below my knee. It just doesn't work. Um, and so if I had known that, um, you know, five years ago, I think I would have been pretty frustrated that what you mean, I'm going to do all this work and still not get that back. But th there's no end, you know, to the recovery process. And so what's encouraging and, and what I'd like people to know is that, you know, even if it is five years or six years or five weeks down the road, you're, there are still things that you can get better at. And what I'm finding is that even though, you know, my fingers aren't working or my elbow is, you know, joints aren't working like they should. It's only because the signals aren't getting through that part of my brain. You know, it's, there's nothing wrong with my leg or my arm. It's, it's just that my brain can't talk to that part of my body. So what can I do about it? And what I've, what I've learned and want people to know is that, you know, there are, there's, there's really no limit to what you can accomplish. You know, you, you can find workarounds for just about anything. And so even if 
you know, there, there are physical things that aren't improving with you. Um, you can still improve uh, years and years and years later. And that brings us to our hack of the week. I use my tone all the time. And so uh, I, I don't like not use my hand just because it's, it's, uh, it doesn't open. So I, what I will do is I will, when I tie my shoes, my, my OT taught me how to do it with one hand. But after a while I realized, well, if I ever want to get good at using my second hand again, I need to try it. So I use my, the tone in my hand to do everything that I possibly can even though it doesn't open, um, I create loops and I create just like when I'm tying my shoe, um, I use the tone to pull um, anything I can. And so I'm not afraid to, uh, to use, you know, the, the limited ability that I have in it to, to accomplish things. And so I think that's, that's one way that I, that I try to get by every day. It's there. I can see it. It just, uh, it just doesn't respond, you know, like I want it to, but that doesn't mean that it, it gets to take a break. <laughs> Absolutely. So if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Well, um, I, you know, I, I spend all my time at the Air Force Academy coaching tennis and um, our team is is in season. You know, we, we compete all year round. We travel all over the country. Um, we play on the East Coast. We play on the West Coast. We we play in Montana and Boise, places you're familiar with. Um, Fantastic you know, places. Yeah, if you're if you're a sports fan, um, you know you can you can follow us um, on the Air Force Falcons, you know, website. But uh, um, that's that's just kind of work related. Um, I, I try to engage with as, as many audiences as I can. I, I do some talking with with uh, cadets at our school. Um, I talk to our brain and behavior class about strokes and neuro, neuro um, deficits. And um, I tried to engage, you know, in the adaptive sports community too. Fantastic. Fantastic. So Dan, thank you so much for sharing your story with us this week. Um, thank, thanks so much for having me on, Bill. And your, your website or your, your, your podcast is incredible. Um, I hope it reaches a lot of folks and really helps them out because it, it's very, um, very educational and you give a lot of support to people. So thanks for what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I love chatting with Dan. He has a, a great story and a lot of it resonates with uh, the things that I try to do. Now, of course, I don't have the military experience that he does or the athletic experience that he does, but a lot of the idea of problem solving and looking at how do I solve this issue? How do I make this weakened arm still do stuff? How do I go ahead and learn more about what's going on with my body? Those are a lot of the things that really resonated with me and that played a big part in my own recovery. So what do you think about Dan's story? Do you have any experience with the Wounded Warrior Program or the Invictus Games? Let us know in the comments over at strokecast.com slash Dan. I've also been sharing more videos over at facebook.com slash strokecast, including comments on the recent heart and stroke walk. So head on over there to check it out. I actually did some videos from the Seattle Center uh, talking about the heart and stroke walk, and that was a lot of fun. So you can just search for strokecast on Facebook or just go directly to facebook.com slash strokecast. If you listen to StrokeCast on an Apple device, be sure to rate and review the show in the iTunes store so others can learn from your experience. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.